Middle East. Masharq al Hamzra Atihan. Kabere Miyane. Orta Doğu. There are wars going on in many parts of the world today. But the Middle Eastern countries seem to have far more than their fair share. Not only the war between the Arab states and Israel, but conflicts involving many of the other countries as well. Even within some of these countries, we hear of periodic rebellions and acts of violence by minority ethnic groups, such as the Armenians and the Kurds. Why is there so much fighting in the Middle East? Has it always been like this? No. As a matter of fact, it hasn't. For most of its history, the Middle East has been no more violent than anywhere else in the world. It's only really over the last 50 or 60 years that Middle Eastern countries have been involved in crisis after crisis. Why is this? Well, first of all, they could hardly have gotten into trouble much earlier because most of them didn't even exist as states prior to World War I. Today, there are 26 sovereign states in the Middle East. In 1914, there were only two, the Ottoman Empire and Iran. Ibn Saud ruled over a loose confederation of tribes in Central Arabia. The rest of the Middle East was under the control of various European powers. There's as yet no sign of many of the countries we're familiar with today. There's no Turkey or Lebanon or Jordan or Israel. There are only very roughly defined geographical regions, such as Armenia, Kurdistan, Iraq, Syria, and Palestine whose boundaries are so vague that they aren't even marked on the map. Now this whole business of boundaries and frontiers and nation states is one of the keys to understanding why there's so much turmoil in the Middle East today. In the West, we take nationalism for granted. The idea that the world should be divided up into nation states based on a single nationality, groups of people who share the same language, the same culture, and the same territory. But in the Middle East, this idea of nationalism didn't exist until quite recently. And the only two independent states in the region, Iran and the Ottoman Empire, were each a swirling mass of many different languages and cultures, all mixed up together. Tremendous diversity. Just like all the other Middle Eastern empires that preceded them, which were multinational by definition, they had a tolerance of diversity. In fact, the cultural pluralism of the region has been maintained for thousands of years, whether the imperial rulers were Persians, Greeks, Romans, Arabs, Turks. 
It was the last of these empires, that of the Ottoman Turks, that was the most multicultural and multilingual of all. The Ottoman Empire was very extensive. At its peak, at the beginning of the 17th century, with the exception of Iran and Morocco, it controlled almost the whole of the Middle East, as well as a large chunk of Europe. So the Ottoman Empire contained not only Turks and Arabs and Jews and Kurds and Armenians, but also Greeks and Albanians and Bosnians and Serbs. These people didn't think of themselves as Turks or Arabs or Kurds. That's not how people were divided up. If you'd asked anyone in the Ottoman Empire to identify himself, he would probably have said, I'm a Muslim, or I'm a Christian, or I'm a Jew. People's identity was primarily in terms of religion. The state religion of the Ottoman Empire was, of course, Islam. But the Ottomans also had the same sort of tolerance and respect for Christianity and Judaism that the earlier Muslim empires had had when they referred to the Christians and the Jews as Ahl Kitab, the people of the book. But the Ottomans took this people of the book idea one step further with their millet system. The word millet comes from the Arabic millah, which means religious community. And the Ottoman Empire was a mosaic of a dozen or more different millets. The most important of these were the Muslim millet, the Jewish millet, and two Christian millets. The Greek Orthodox and the Armenian. Each of these religious communities lived in a little world of its own, quite separate from the others. This is still reflected today in the old parts of Middle Eastern cities, which are divided into quarters. The Armenian quarter, the Jewish quarter, the Muslim quarter, and so on. In one way, the Millets were like states within a state, each with its own laws and its own social organization. As long as they paid their taxes, the Sultan left them alone. But in another way, the Millets weren't like states at all, since they had no physical boundaries. You couldn't see them on the map, because they didn't exist in a geographical sense. They were portable. You carried your Millet and its laws and regulations with you, wherever you went. This is very difficult for us to understand because we are so used to thinking in terms of physical space. But the Millets occupied a spiritual space that transcended all the different Ottoman territories and regions. But all this was to change with the coming of the Western idea of nationalism. From the 17th century onwards, the Ottoman Empire begins to decline. And as the Ottomans grow weaker, the Europeans grow stronger and gradually whittle away at the edges of the empire. First Algeria and then Tunisia are lost to the French, then Egypt to the British, while Libya goes to the Italians. And then finally, the Trucial states and Oman and Aden come under the influence of the British until this is all that is left on the eve of the First World War. The Ottoman Empire has lost all of its possessions in North Africa, 
and everything in Europe except for this area surrounding Istanbul. The sick man of Europe is now very ill indeed. And it's the First World War that finishes him off altogether when the Ottomans make the fatal mistake of siding with the Germans. This leads to the final breakup of the empire and all that the Turks managed to salvage is Anatolia itself, which Mustafa Kemal Ataturk transforms into the new Republic of Turkey in 1923. Meanwhile, the British and the French rush in to divide up the Fertile Crescent between them. The British occupy the former Ottoman regions of Iraq and Palestine, and the League of Nations draws lines around these areas and calls them mandated territories. At a later stage, Palestine is arbitrarily split in two, with everything to the west of the River Jordan still being called Palestine, and everything on the other side of the Jordan being called Transjordan. In the meantime, the League of Nations gives the French the mandate to occupy the region of Syria, which they turn into two separate territories by drawing a line between this part of Syria and this part, which is given the name Lebanon. Over the next 25 years, all of these mandated territories achieve independence. Iraq, 1932. Syria and Lebanon, 1941. And Transjordan in 1946, which is to become the Kingdom of Jordan in 1950. As for Palestine, in 1947, the United Nations vote to partition it into a Jewish state and an Arab state. But then the British withdraw in 1948, and the first Arab-Israeli war breaks out. As a result, the newly proclaimed State of Israel expands to cover this area, and the remainder of Palestine is taken over by Transjordan and Egypt. This is how the seeds of many of the present problems in the Middle East were sown. Under the Ottoman Empire, a person was simply a Jew from Baghdad, or a Christian from Damascus, or a Muslim from Jerusalem. But as soon as the regions of Iraq, Syria, and Palestine are transformed into separate countries with well-defined borders, their inhabitants are forced to start thinking of themselves as Iraqis, Syrians, and Palestinians. Territory suddenly becomes very important, and that's when the trouble starts. The Iraqis get involved in border disputes with the Iranians. And the Syrians start arguing over territory with the Turks. The Syrians also claim that Lebanon should be part of their state, since the old Ottoman region of Greater Syria used to include Mount Lebanon. And Lebanon itself was torn by a series of civil wars, with each of the various Muslim and Christian groups, who had lived in quite separate communities under the Ottomans, competing for control of the new state of Lebanon. And in Palestine, the Arabs and the Jews who had lived in relative harmony for thousands of years, clash over who has more right to this newly defined territory. And so it goes on. Nationalism has caused a complete breakdown of the traditional Middle Eastern way of organizing society. With the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, everyone has become involved in a frantic scramble for a homeland, an idea that hadn't existed before in most of the Middle East. 
the Palestinians are the most obvious losers in this contest for real estate. But there are two other peoples who also find themselves without a country of their own in the Middle East, the Armenians and the Kurds. <laughs> As we've seen, the Armenians are Christians and were one of the most important millets in the Ottoman Empire. They were, in fact, the very first people in the world to adopt Christianity as their official religion in 300 AD. It's fairly easy to spot an Armenian because their names nearly always end in Ion, Gulbenkian, Khachaturian. Ion simply means son of. It's the equivalent of the Arabic Ibn or the Hebrew Ben. And like the Arabs and the Jews, the Armenians have also been living in the Middle East for thousands of years in this region, which was known as Armenia for most of its history although it was seldom politically independent and varied quite a lot in size over the centuries. The other forgotten people in the Middle East are the Kurds, who are Muslims. One Kurd nearly everyone has heard of is Saladin, who was a sultan of Egypt and Syria, and famous for the chivalry and gallantry with which he fought Richard the Lionheart, the leader of the Crusaders. The Kurds have also lived in the Middle East for a very long time, in this area, which is known as Kurdistan, the land of the Kurds, although it has almost never known political independence. In 1914, there were still Armenian and Kurdish territories in the Ottoman Empire. But the Armenians had already been affected by nationalist ideas imported from Europe and had begun to agitate for an independent Armenia. And this was to lead to tragedy. When World War I broke out, many Armenians sided with the Russians. At the same time, Turkish nationalists and the Ottoman government had started to claim that Anatolia should be called Turkey and that the Turks had the greatest right to live there. This led the Ottomans to compel the resettlement of hundreds of thousands of Armenians in 1915, an operation which was accompanied by atrocities and an appalling loss of life. Those Armenians who survived this disaster dispersed all over the world. But the Armenians did finally get some sort of an independent Armenia, only it was no longer in the Middle East. At the end of World War I, the Russians took over much of the area that had been the Ottoman territory of Armenia. And this is now part of the Soviet Union, where it is called the Soviet Socialist Republic of Armenia. There are now about four million Armenians living in Soviet Armenia, and another two million dispersed throughout the world and only a few hundred thousand Armenians still actually live in the Middle East itself, mainly in Turkey, Lebanon, Syria, and Iran. Nevertheless, the Armenians have never forgiven the Turks for what happened in 1915, just as they have never forgotten their original home in the Middle East. And this has recently led Armenian extremists into acts of terrorism directed against the Turkish government. As for the Kurds, they also began to develop some form of national consciousness in the 19th century. And this was heightened after World War I, when they suddenly found that Kurdistan 
had become a no man's land, overlapping three nation states, Iran, Iraq, and Turkey. Now, Kurdistan is a very rugged and mountainous region. This has obliged many of the 10 million or so Kurds who are estimated to live in this region to lead a semi-nomadic existence as they move their flocks between their summer pastures on the mountain slopes and their winter quarters in the valleys. This means that the Kurds are continually crossing the boundaries of three different countries, none of which they can really call home. So it's hardly surprising that since the 1920s, the Kurds have been agitating for an independent Kurdistan and rebelling against the governments of Iran, Iraq, and Turkey. So all these problems, the conflicts between many of the Middle Eastern countries and the rebellions of stateless peoples, such as the Palestinians, the Armenians, and the Kurds, are to a large extent the legacy of nationalist ideas imported from the West. We often complain about these people in the Middle East who are always fighting, and about the weary round of shuttle diplomacy that we have to engage in to try to patch up all these differences. But we forget that it was the West who dreamt up many of the new frontiers that the Middle Easterners are fighting over. And dreams can very easily become nightmares. Mm -hmm.